Alright, so you guys have made it through all of the basic genetics information, the reviews of baby bio information, and now what I want to do in this lesson is go into some more depth uh, with you, add in some College Board specific information, um, some new vocab terms that we didn't cover in the baby bio course. Um, the first thing I'd like to talk about is what happens when instead of one gene influencing is influencing a trait, you end up with multiple genes influencing a trait. So two or more genes involved in uh, a trait and determining how a trait is expressed is what we're looking at. Um, and the first example of this is epistasis. And this is one that you have dealt with before. You've dealt with it kind of separately. If you've looked at an albinism gene, for example, this is a gene that's, that's epistatic. What that means is um, an organism is born with pigmentation genes. So in human, they're born with a gene for the production of melanin or not. But oftentimes, another gene, this gene that can influence albinism, influences whether or not the pigment that's produced is actually implanted into, um, say, hair follicles or the skin, and that's what causes albinism. So it's a separate gene in another location that influences whether or not another gene gets expressed. So in mice, you have black mice and brown mice, but then there's another uh, another gene um, that for albinism that if it's present in the homozygous recessive condition will will make will produce a a mouse that lacks pigmentation, um, and that's our albino mouse. Okay. Um, Another type of trait that we kind of mentioned in Baby Bio is the polygenic trait. Um, the trait that um, exists or that is, is influenced by multiple genes, and we kind of touched on it a little tiny bit in Baby Bio, and we said that when you have this, what you have is a spectrum of possible phenotypes on a bell curve. So it's not one, two, or three phenotypes, or even four or five. You've got this range of phenotypes here. Um, and uh, here's a, a graph that's showing you a phenotype distribution for a uh, number of students and their heights. And notice this is ranging from 58 inches to 74 inches with everything in between. And what you see is that you get most individuals in the middle uh, range of the phenotypes. Um, and this is what, what we're talking about, really. If we were to make it into a nice smooth curve, you would have what we call a bell curve. Um, where you get most individuals are in the middle and then you have fewer at the lower extremes of phenotype and fewer at the higher extremes of phenotype. So height is one example, skin color, hair color. Down here at the bottom you can see why that is the case. Um, and the reason for that is that in general the more dominance you add, the more dominant alleles that you have, the more it adds something to the phenotype. So in the case of height, the more dominance you add to a person's phenotype, the more inches of height you would add. Um, if you're talking about skin color, it usually means more pigmentation, hair color, more pigmentation, and so on. The fewer dominance you have, the less you have of something. And so what you're seeing here is uh, wheat kernel color, right? The parental generation, you crossed a white kernel with a red kerneled wheat right? Um, and you, you get these pinkish ones, and if you cross those together, what you end up is, with is this kind of distribution that you see here, our nice bell curve. Um, and this graph is explaining to you why that bell curve exists, right? In the first generation, the pure white line was all recessive. The pure red line had all dominance, which meant that all of their offspring were mixed, three dominant alleles and three recessive alleles, right, for these genes A, B, and C, because you have three genes controlling kernel color. When you cross these individuals together, and of course you could do this, right, because you remember from the dye hybrid um, video that I gave you, I showed you a little trick for how to do tri-hybrid crosses, right, a little math shortcut. You could use that math shortcut and you would end up with this, right, so you would have very few individuals or none that have all recessive alleles, right? Some that might have um, one 
dom or I'm sorry, all dominant alleles. But then notice the reason why so many are in the middle range of of the graph here is because most of the time we don't inherit all recessive or all dominant. What we inherit is some combination of dominant and recessive alleles. And you're most likely to get individuals right here in the middle with three dominant, three recessive. And then that, that likelihood drops on both sides, right? To have two dominant and four recessive, one dominant, five recessive, zero dominant, and all recessive. And then on this this side, to have four dominant and two recessive, right? Uh, five dominant, one recessive, and six dominant. Okay, so that kind of explains why you get that bell curve of possibilities. But in reality, that whole concept of dominance um, is kind of fuzzy. Um, the more and more we learn about genetics, the more we realize that dominant may not be as dominant as we thought it was. Um, if you look at metabolic disorders like Tay-Sachs, um, Tay-Sachs prevents individuals with the disorder from metabolizing lipids because of a malfunctioning enzyme. So an enzyme, a lipase that should break apart lipids is not functioning. Now, when you look at this, the traditional way of looking at, at Tay-Sachs is to say that if you get two copies of the allele, the recessive allele, um, you have Tay-Sachs, right? So at, at the organismal level, if we just look at the organism, they have two copies of the recessive, which means they have Tay-Sachs. But if we dig deeper, right, and we look at the biochemical level, in other words, we look at the rate at which... Um, somebody metabolizes um, these lipids using this particular enzyme, what we find is actually something that looks more like incomplete dominance. Because what happens is people who are heterozygous for, their, for not having Tay-Sachs, basically, right, meaning they have one dominant copy of the allele and one recessive copy of the allele, um, actually metabolize lipids at a slower rate than individuals who are homozygous dominant, individuals who do not have Tay-Sachs and are dominant for that condition. Um, so what you end up with is this, this third phenotype where you have the individuals who can, who can metabolize lipids quickly, individuals who can metabolize at a moderate rate, and then individuals who can't metabolize lipids at all. Right, So that's why we say it kind of appears to be incompletely dominant. When we dig even deeper still and we look on a molecular level at the enzymes themselves, what we find is that the individuals who are heterozygous produce equal levels of functioning and non-functioning enzymes. So the dominant allele is producing these functional enzymes. The recessive allele is producing non-functional enzymes. And depending on which chromosome gets used, in the production of those enzymes in the individual, um, you get half functional, half not functional, which means really it appears to be co-dominant. Um, we can see this also with things like sickle cell. Some textbooks call sickle cell an incompletely dominant disorder now um, because of this as well. So I hope I didn't blow your mind too much there, but um, our, our understanding of what dominant means and what recessive means is really an evolving concept. All right, so let's go on and look at some other genetic patterns that you get um, as well. One is X inactivation. Um, obviously, an X chromosome is an important thing. You have to have an X chromosome in order to survive, um, in order to gestate and be born. The X chromosome has some important um, genes on it, right? But if you look at our simple Punnett square here, right, for gender, and you've looked at this before, dad has an X and a Y, mom has two X chromosomes, and when we cross them, um, all the females get two copies of the X chromosome, the male gets an X and a Y. Um, we don't need to use both of our X chromosomes. If we're female, we don't use both of them. We take one of our X chromosomes and we wrap it in protein and shove it off into a corner of the nucleus, if one can say that a nucleus has a quarter. Um, but that's what we call a bar body. And if we looked at the cells of a female under a microscope, we would see that darkly stained bar body like a little dark lump in the nucleus, 
Now, what's interesting is cells get to choose which X chromosome they deactivate. And, you know, because of paracrine signaling, a lot of times little patches of cells will choose to inactivate the same X chromosome. So maybe one patch chooses to inactivate this little red chromosome, one patch chooses to act inactivate the little um, blue chromosome, whatever. Um, but what's interesting here is you can get patterns, and you can really see this if you look at a calico cat that has black and orange splotches. One of the X chromosomes in a calico cat is for the orange coloration. The other is for the black coloration. And depending on which X chromosome gets activated, you can actually see patterns of X inactivation in a calico cat. So if you ever see a cat that's got that black and orange coloration, you know without even looking it's female because the only way you can get that is X inactivation. Um, while we're on the topic of X and Y chromosomes, let's skip down here also and not forget about the fact that some sex-linked traits have Y chromosome inheritance. And again, looking at our square, the reason why I did the, the blue and the red is to show you. Remember, Dad gives his daughters a copy of his X chromosome. The only recipients of his Y chromosomes are his sons. Okay, so if there is a trait on this Y chromosome to be passed, right, the only individuals who can inherit it are his sons um, and not daughters. So Y chromosome traits always pass from fathers to sons, you don't usually have to do any kind of Punnett square for that because a man only has one Y chromosome to give. So if there's a disorder found on that Y chromosome, he's going to pass that disorder to any son that he has. All right. Um, also, don't forget about genetic linkage, right? Um, in that um, lab bench activity that you did with meiosis, you should have looked at um, linkage and linkage mapping. Um, when you when we did the the sorderia part of that lab um, on lab bench, um, essentially what you're doing is showing that you know traits don't segregate when they are found on the same chromosomes, right? Um, that traits only segregate if they're found on different chromosomes. That's when they can separate into different cells. If they're on the same chromosome, we call them linked. And the only way that you get recombinations of linked genes is via crossing over during meiosis. So only crossing over is capable of, um, of showing um, any kind of genetic recombination there, um, as opposed to independent assortment, which can get you all kinds of recombination for non-linked genes. Um, and remember also that the greater the distance between two linked genes, the higher the percent of recombinants you're going to have because there's a greater chance that you're going to get crossing over occurring between those two points on the chromosome. Um, in cases where um, you have genes that are linked and really super close together, you're going to see very few numbers of recombinants, so you're going to get low percentages of recombinants. All right, and finally, there is pleiotropy, and pleiotropy exists when a gene, a single gene, actually influences multiple traits. So a great example of this is sickle cell disease, which we're all familiar with, right? It's the disease that causes the misshapen um, red blood cells, right? And that's one uh, of the effects, right, which causes uh, problems with um, oxygenation of tissues, right? But another effect of this sickling is that sickle, sickled cells tend to stick together, and those sickled cells will cause blood clots, right? So that's another example of an effect, a pleiotropic effect of a single gene. The gene causes sickled cell shapes that can cause blood clots because those, those cells can stick together. The cells also become brittle and can break, which means patients become anemic, um, with, with sickle cell, there's another example. Those blood clots cause pain. There's another, another thing that happens as a result of one single genetic, um, one single allele, uh, or really inheriting two copies of this recessive allele. And that's what we mean when we say pleiotropy. One gene, multiple effects. All right. Uh, the next thing I want to talk to you about is lethal alleles. And lethal alleles are not they're not really any different than looking at any other type of allele, um, but it's just that you do need to understand that there are some alleles that if you inherit them in 
a certain combination, then the offspring don't survive, and that's going to mess with your ratios. Okay, so an example of that would be this agouti gene that you see here. Okay, so our agouti gene right here is a gene that produces yellow fur color, um, and the agouti gene itself is recessive. Okay, and uh, this is not agouti. This would really be black, okay, if we're talking about mice. And this agouti gene actually exists in several iterations um, across multiple mammal mammalian species. It's tied to a bunch of things, but for now, let's just look at mice. Um, so um, if a mouse um, inherits two copies of this little a allele, it's lethal. So if we do a cross between a black mouse... Right, so this black mouse, um, and let's call this a uh, a black mouse that is homozygous, right? And a mouse that is a goody, right? Um, the only way to be black is to be homozygous here. The agouti mouse would ex express um, express the little a and the big a. So if we if we do this cross, right? This is our cross. Here's our black mouse. Here's our agouti mouse on the chart. Two of our offspring end up being black, and two of our offspring end up being agouti, right? Um, where they would, so these would have the black, black fur color, these would have the agouti, which really is, is you see some black hairs and some yellow hairs. And again, it's called recessive in textbooks, but then that would kind of behave more like a, a uh, co-dominant allele, right? If you cross two agouti mice, right, like this, I'm not going to do the whole square, what you would end up with is one of the offspring dying because they've inherited two copies of that little a allele, which throws off your ratios, okay? So your ratio, instead of being your typical classic one to two to one ratio of genotypes, um, would end up being a 1 to 2 ratio with all of the agoutis, um, the ones that have the two copies of the agouti allele dying. All right, and finally, just a couple of reminders about genetics because it's really easy to think of genotype as being determinant, right? Genotype does not determine phenotype. I really, really try my best to use the word influence, a lot, right? Um, I know when we're looking at genetics problems and we ha have to just count ratios that it's, uh, you know, it's easier to just think of genotype as being determinant. But don't forget that you can have environmental influences that can affect gene expression, right? Um, the classic example here in the South is that hydrangea bush, right? Where if you plant the hydrangea in acidic soil, it flowers with pink flowers. If you plant it in basic soil, it flowers with blue flowers, right? So that's an example of the environment influencing um, the expression of that flower color gene. And don't forget about a couple other things, right? This chromosome theory of inheritance says the chromosome carries um, the genetic information of an individual. Um, but there are about two to th or three dozen autosomally inherited traits, meaning they're on the first, uh, the non-sex determining pairs, um, that depend on which parent passed the gene. Okay, so there's an insulin-like growth factor in mice where um, on, this particular gene is only active if you inherit it from the father's side of the gene. Okay, so this is not, if we're talking about two to three dozen traits and they're not necessarily human traits, um, that's not that many genes that follow this particular pattern, um, but they can. Finally, don't forget our, about our friends uh, the extra nuclear genes, remember, mitochondria have their own DNA, right? And because the egg cell pr gives the the fetus all of its um, all of its organelles, you know, a sperm when it fertilizes an egg is really just delivering a genetic payload, just the the other half of the chromosomes that need that are needed. Um, the mitochondria um, always come from mothers, 
and get passed on to their children. So all of these genes are matrilineal. Okay, so when we're talking about all this other genetic stuff, we're talking about the chromosomal um, genome, but there's also an extra nuclear genome present um, outside of the, the nucleus in um, the mitochondria.